Good morning. Uh, welcome back to session three um, of the United States Department of Education negotiated rulemaking for program integrity and institutional quality. I'm Cindy Jeffries from FMCS and I'll be your facilitator for this morning's session. We do have a very robust agenda again these four days. We would like to remind everyone to utilize their time to provide new clarification, concern, or suggested changes. Please do not utilize the time to restate or um, voice support of points that have already been made. Those types of um, suggestions and uh, proposed uh, changes to language or support can certainly be placed in the chat um, and the chat uh, will be transcribed and posted on the department's website at the conclusion of the sessions. As the committee addresses each issue's proposed regulatory text after discussion and thorough um, time to be able to uh, address concerns and questions, consensus will be taken issue by issue on the entire document. Um, does the department have any opening comments, Greg? Excuse me, I was on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 uh, I, I, no, 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 I'm just say I'm, I'm happy to be back with everybody and uh, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a productive week. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks, Greg. So now we'll go on to the official roll call for record. Um, for business officers from institutions of higher education. Bill Wegslar. Good morning. Good morning, Dom Chase. Present. Good morning. Civil Rights Organizations and Consumer Advocates, Carolyn Fast. Good morning. Good morning. And Maheen Sanchez. Good morning, Ruth. Good morning. Financial Aid Administrators, Joellen Price. Good morning. And Zach Goodwin as the alternate. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Tribal college, Colleges and Universities, and Minority Serving Institutions, Institutions of Higher Education, eligible to receive federal assistance under Title III, Parts A and F, and Title V of the HEA. Dr. Charles Prince, Primary. Doesn't look like he has joined this yet. D'Angelo Sands as alternate. Okay, looks like D'Angelo hasn't joined us at this point either. Institutional accrediting agencies recognized by the secretary, Jamie Studley. Morning. Morning. And Michael McComas. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. Legal assistant organizations, Robin Smith. Morning, everyone. Morning. Sophie Lang as the alternate. Good morning. Good morning. Private nonprofit institutions of higher education, Erica Linden, primary. I'm present. Scott Dolan, alternate. Good morning. Good morning, both of you. Uh, bear with me one second. All right. Next, we have programmatic accrediting agencies recognized by the secretary to include state agencies recognized for approval of nurse education. We have primary Dr. Laura Racer King. Good morning. Good morning and alternate Amy Ackerson. Good morning. Good morning. Proprietary institutions of higher education. Primary Jillian Klein. Good morning. Good morning Jillian. Alternate David Cohen. Good morning. Good morning. Public four year institutions of higher education. Primary Jason Lorgan. Good morning. Good morning. Alternate Alyssa Dobson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Public two year institutions of higher education. Primary is Joe Alice Blondin. Hi there. Hi. Alternate is Michael Ciosi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. State Attorneys General. 
primary is Diana Hooley. Good morning. Good morning, Diana, and the alternate is vacant. State officials, including state higher education executive officers, state authorizing agencies, and state regulators of institutions of higher education. Primary John Ware. Good morning. Morning. Alternate Robert Anderson. Morning, everyone. Hello. Student borrowers, including currently enrolled borrowers and groups representing them. Primary is Jessica Morales. And the alternate is Emmett Blaney. He will be joining after lunch. OK, thanks, Jesse, and welcome. U.S. military service members, veterans, and groups are presenting them. Primary, Bar Nasarian. Good morning. Alternate, Ashlyn haycock Loman. Good morning. Good morning. And um, next we have the U.S. Department of Education lead negotiator, Greg Martin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We also have several non-voting participants from the department and from the Office of General Counsel, Mr. Re Denise Morelli for good issues morning. other than, and good morning, Denise, and you're for issues other than accreditation. Correct. Okay, Ms. Donna Mangold will be for accreditation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. David Mooser. Good morning. David. Good morning. And Mr. Herman Bounds. Herman's not with us yet. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. He is. Good morning, yep, Herman. Yeah, I'm here. Good okay. Um, have I missed anyone? Okay. From FMCS, your facilitation consists of myself, Cindy Jeffries, Brady Roberts, Crystal Smith, and Kevin Wagner. So now that we've made all the introductions, um, we can move on to our agenda. Maheen? Uh, yes, uh, before we continue, I know we have a lot on this agenda today, so I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but I do uh, I hope everyone doesn't mind waiting a couple minutes because I want to call a caucus uh, with the department and the department only. Okay. And is that just yourself, Maheen? Correct. Along with the department? Okay. Greg, who would be attending from the department? Um, I, I, just to clarify, Maheen, the topic is trio. Correct. Uh, uh, yeah, from the department would be um, uh, our, our attorney for a trio, which would be Hannah Hodell. Uh, the uh, uh, chair of that committee, which is uh, Aaron Washington, and um, myself. Okay, so Greg, Hannah, and Aaron, and Maheen. Maheen, do you have any idea how about how long uh, you'd like? Yeah, it should be quick. Um, Ten minutes. Um, okay. Hopefully, hopefully before. Okay. Uh, Julian, you have your hand up. Yeah, I can wait till we get back. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, Brady, do you have those rooms set up or Crystal? Yep, they're all set up. Ready to move them? OK, so we will take a 10 minute uh, break while the parties caucus and it is 10.08, so approximately 10.18, we will get back together.
Okay, welcome back. The caucus has returned. Is there any report out, Maheen? Uh, no, I look forward to tomorrow's okay. discussion. Okay, great. Um, so with that, uh, Jillian, you had your hand up, so the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was hoping just as we kick off this week, um, I think for me it would be helpful to hear from the department or the facilitators about how maybe structurally this week will look different than the last two weeks that we've had together, just since we're running out of time a bit. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen, and I think Laura mentioned this in February too, a ton of proposals that have come through from negotiators, I think in the hopes that we could move towards compromise or consensus positions. Um, and I think in many cases, there hasn't been sort of a feedback loop on why the department hasn't um, elected to use some of that language. And in some cases, I think the department's subsequent red lines have been sort of further afield from where we've started based on the, what the department indicated the issues were to, to solve in January. Um, so I'm just, I'm nervous about time, you guys, and I'm wondering if there's a different approach that we'll be using this week um, in the spirit of getting us all towards compromise, especially since um, I think there's a lot of things that we saw in some of these issue papers that don't look much like where we started in January. Um, in 2019, when many of us did negotiated rulemaking, the department literally, I think it was like Aaron Washington, sat around the table with us and was sort of updating and typing new red lines as we were going through the last week of NAGREG. And I'm curious if that's the approach we'll be using this week or how exactly is this week going to look different in a way that's sort of an efficient use of time for negotiators to move towards consensus? Okay. Um, thank you, Jillian. Um, we will, uh, there may be times, Jillian, to answer your question that the department uh, and the negotiators will uh, elect to do some real-time edits. Um, those are generally, um, tend to be on the less complicated side um, to, to um, more efficiently use our time since this is the last week. Um, one of the reasons I gave the reminder about rehashing um, things that have already been said is it not not an attempt to stifle people's thought processes or um, their um, speaking, but to better efficiently use our time. OK, um, in the areas where uh, the department um, may not be able to make any changes. Um, I know that um, past rulemakings, as well as this one, the department has indicated where they can't. Uh, Greg, do you want to add to that or? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would point out that the, the, the red lines we have now are, you know, represents um, the department's position as well as uh, and 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 represent uh, some of the proposals we have received. Obviously, um, they don't represent um, every single proposal we've received. Um, we, we are not you know, um, in some cases we don't um, concur with that, and others there's just. And, and as far as going back to the table, I I, I try to address uh, those um, uh, proposals that we have received. Um, if I were to address every single line item that we get, there would just be no time to do it. Um, however, if if uh, so, what, so the red lines we have back in this in this final um, session do reflect where the department is. Uh, it, it is an open negotiation, and anybody is welcome to um, to inquire about why uh, a particular uh, regulation is worded the way it is, or why the department didn't go a certain way. So if I if I neglect to uh, to to cover any of those um, proposals, or or someone feels I haven't done it adequately. Um, they could feel free to to, to ask um, for more clarification. As far as the time constraints go, like yes, the third week is always difficult because it's the week we're going to vote, we're going to vote on consensus. So, um, and I and I think that no matter how long discussions occur, there has to be a point at which, um, you know, everything that has been can be said has been said, and, and people have to make up make up their minds to, to uh, which way they are they're going to go. Hopefully, with consensus. Um, so we'll make every effort, uh, every effort to do that. I do acknowledge that, I do acknowledge the time, the time constraints here um, that that are involved. And uh, but again, um, people are any any of the negotiators are welcome to bring up at any point um, any of the proposals or why the department didn't go in a certain direction. And just to reiterate what um, uh, Cindy said about the real time updates, if if we if we 
can do that if there is a request for a change in the language that the department's amenable to that we feel would uh, would, would move towards consensus we do have the capability to have our uh, I know Aaron did that before we we have Vanessa and Joe doing that now. Um, we do have the capability of making those changes. Uh, maybe not exactly in real time, but but certainly mm -hmm. in a few moments. Thank you. Yeah, just one follow up question, I guess. So is the idea will we, for example, this morning we'll do RT4 and then are we doing like the consensus check this morning or are we doing that on Thursday? Yes, we'll take unclear. consensus. We'll vote. We'll we, we will. Um, we will take a vote on consensus after each um, after each topic has been discussed. So the first one will be RTT four. That's David, and after uh, he's done with that, we will we will vote on consensus when we're through with that. We we believe that's a better way to go than just to go through all of them and then go back on go back on Thursday and and, and you know have to revisit areas of what we've already discussed. So we will be taking the consensus checks after we are. Uh, done with the discussion on each individual topic. OK, so really we're just you all are explaining the red lines that we got in advance of this week and then there's actually uh, not yes. a compromise yes. that's happening throughout this week. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to we'll, no, we'll, we'll, we'll go. We'll go over the red lines. Uh, we'll go over the red lines that we have. So the department's rationale will just as we did in the previous weeks. We'll open the floor for discussion um, and. Uh, uh, and of course, we, you know, we have our facilitators to um, speak. One of the jobs of the facilitator and, and, and uh, FMCS so did a good job of this is to determine the kind of um, find the point at which there uh, it seems logical to call for a uh, for a, for a consensus check. Of course, it's the department's decision, you know, whether to do that and at what point. But but there there does have to be it, it's let's be honest, there's a bit of an art involved in, in you know, knowing the point at which to to do that. And you know, and um, so it will be after each one. The consensus is by topic. And I would just add, Jillian, then on the, the topics that span um, two days, um, in like accreditation, those uh, will be taken at the end of the conclusion of all the scheduled time for each of the topics. So R2T4, um, R2T4 will be today, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, and distance ed is scheduled for this afternoon, and that also would have consensus taken this afternoon. Um, does that answer your questions, Julian? Sure. Okay. Thanks. And can I just um, add that you know, obviously, I want to reiterate this is we're still in negotiations, so the language you see here is what the department's. Proposed, I guess, but, but the struggle is if we're just, for example, on RC four, like talking about this morning, and then we're doing a consensus vote. I, I guess it doesn't feel to me like we're still negotiating um, because I I think I would expect to see the department come back one more time. I don't know. I. We're out of time and I think we're so far apart now, even based on where the department started and where negotiators have sort of made proposals and the department in many cases has moved sort of further afield. And so if we had like eight more months to negotiate, I maybe we could get there, but I, I just don't know how to feel. Like, why don't we just take a vote right now on all of the issue papers and have four days back? I don't. I just don't understand how this week is gonna be an active negotiation based on how it's- Well, been, as, 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 as I pointed question. out, there, there obviously is, 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 is not enough time because we don't have a subsequent um, session to do what we've done in the past is come back with you know additional papers, additional uh, changes rather um, the next time because the, there won't be a next time. But but we, we are still in negotiation and as much as we uh, these what we have here, this text is uh, can be can be um, edited, modified uh, um, for changes that uh, you know are suggested if the department's amenable to those changes. So. Um, uh, there's there is there's, there is still an opportunity. I, I, I respectfully don't agree with the assertion that there's no negotiation here because we have the week to do that. So we, we, we will we will discuss these topics if there's room for um, for compromise that involves additional language or changes. We're, we're certainly willing to do that. I, I, I do take your point that there is a time constraint. Yes, um, this is the last week, so there is more uh, uh, there's more pressure than, than there would have been in the previous weeks. But that's not to say that this is not we're still not negotiating or, or that we cannot make changes or un, or are un, or are unwilling to make changes. So I think that uh, uh, we've heard from the department that you know they are willing to consider changes and those that they are amenable to they you know we do have the capability to deal with those so negotiations is very much taking place and I, I you know I just want to say that regardless of 
how many sessions are scheduled for any given uh, rulemaking, there's always that last week and there's always that pressure. OK, so we're doing our best to address uh, your concerns, Jillian, and um, certainly want to stress and reiterate the fact that this week is very much about negotiations. Um, before I move to Joellen, um, I want to um, announce that uh, Dr. Charles Prince and D'Angelo Sands have joined um, the session this morning. Joellen? Joe Alice, I don't want to put Joe Ellen on oh, the spot. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, it's okay. And just, jo I prefer just Joe. Anyway, um, okay. the question I have is, are we going to vote on each subcomponent or are we voting on the issue paper as a whole? The issue paper as a whole, correct, Greg? That's correct. Each issue paper as a whole will be voted on after the discussion on that issue paper is concluded. It does feel like we're running out the clock a little bit here. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barmack? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Jamie, you had your hand up. Are you? Um, I was putting my questions in the chat. I think I've gotten answers. There'll be temperature checks during the discussion, but before the vote on the paper as a whole. One quick question I had was if any. I know people are thinking things may go long, but if any of them took less time than anticipated, will we just roll into the next available one, depending on what the facilitators and the group think at the time? Yes, if we conclude, um, if, if for instance, if the discussions on um, R2T4 were to go uh, more quickly than is scheduled, uh, we would uh, move on to the next topic. And even though we're not scheduled to do um, state authorization today if um if we were to conclude with um david's topics of uh rtt4 and distance we would move into the discussion on state authorization today so yes we will roll forward uh with everything okay so one of the things i think i hear people um saying that that to me at least would feel like it express negotiation is if there are ideas within any of these items that the department thinks may be possible to bridge the gap or to come up, you know, or they hear something that um, they might be open to discussion and not just the department, anyone um, hears things, whether there's the ability to use the breaks um, or even overnight say this looks like something that we could improve. That's actually not a question. It's a suggestion. Um, you guys know whether that's within your plans, but if there were a bridge suggestion that the department or someone else needed to think about whether we could pause and return to that arena uh, if there was some progress that we thought we could make uh yeah the department's in a position where we to uh I mean, we, we can um we can call caucuses ourselves if we need to so if if something were to come up where we we need to discuss whether or not we would be uh able to accept changes and come back with something we we're certainly in a position to do that and i could Call for that at any time. Hey, okay, thank you. A um, couple other questions, real quick, that were in the uh, chat. It was a question about whether uh, the chats are visible to public viewers. They are not during the live session, but they are visible to everyone, including the public. The transcript is once it's posted and uploaded to the department's website. Um, I think. That is all the questions that were in there. Um, so with that, um, I want to turn it over to um, David for R2T4. All right, thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can go ahead and pull up the um, red line of the R2T4 paper. Um, so in the last session, uh, we heard that the committee had given um, uh, temperature checks that were uh, either um, supportive or um, accepting of the various proposals in the r 4 issue paper, except for one, um, which related to uh, requirements for attendance taking uh, in business education. Uh, so 
I'm going to ask first if anyone wants to talk about the other issues uh, that we hold that until we talk through the um, the issue of attendance taking for online programs. But of course, if others have other things that they want to talk through on elsewhere in the paper, we're glad to do that. So if we could scroll down then to the area um, under discussion. Uh, so we heard a number of proposals uh, related to um, this requirement that the department is proposing uh, to have institutions uh, take attendance and use those attendance records in their return of Title IV calculations uh, for programs for courses offered through distance education. And as you guys know, this language has uh, gone through an evolution throughout um, our negotiations in the past few sessions. Um, one of the last things that we've heard in the prior session was we, we it would be helpful um, to reword this somewhat uh, and potentially separate it from the um, uh, Romanet 1 provisions um, that were sort of the original provisions around uh, attendance taking requirements in order to make it clearer that the department's intent here was to have attendance taking requirements apply uh, to courses offered through distance education. Uh, so this change here is an attempt to do that. We broke out um, what used to be uh, paragraph D into a separate Romanet, Romanet 2, um, where we say an or institution is required to take attendance for each course offered entirely through distance education as defined in 34 CFR 600.2, except for dissertation research courses. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that there is a relationship between uh, this provision and the provision that we are adding uh, separately in the distance education uh, issue paper um, where we're referring to distance education courses. Uh, this is intended to refer to the definition of, of distance education courses that appears uh, in that section. Um, so certainly open to suggestions from the committee if, if you think wording changes are needed here to get to that um, point. Um, so if we scroll down just a little bit, I want to make sure everyone sees kind of how how these changes played out through the remainder of the session, but the remainder of the language. Um, so we just made a few additional changes to um, to move things down um, and uh, move them around in various different ways um, to accommodate that, but there were no other um, changes here. Now, if you go back up, the other important point here is that we also um, were persuaded by uh, negotiators who recommended that dissertation research courses uh, be excluded from this requirement. And the reason for that we decided on that uh, is the dissertation research courses by their nature um, are, are primarily oriented around a student's sort of self-study uh, and work focused on uh, their research, uh, which uh, if it's distance education still needs to involve regular and substantive interaction with their instructor. Um, but we do acknowledge that those kinds of courses um, don't take place in the same kind of framework that the that many uh, most other distance education courses do, uh, where there may be um, a system, uh, an LMS, where students are submitting assignments uh, on, a, on a more frequent basis, where there tend to be interactions uh, directly with the student and the system. Uh, and that many institutions don't have uh, that kind of framework set up for dissertation research courses, which means that the department's primary logic for the use of, uh, for the requirement for uh, attendance taking in online programs, which is that the data is readily available, isn't necessarily the case for these courses. Uh, so for that reason, we, uh, we added that exception here. We did hear other proposals um, from negotiators to exempt other kinds of courses, including just uh, direct assessment uh, courses, um, courses that were that use a subscription based academic calendar and courses that uh, are, are part of um, a non term program. Uh, and some of the reasoning behind those proposals is that um, those those kinds of programs are structured very differently from traditional programs. Um, direct assessment programs uh, in are, are also a sort of more oriented towards self-study um, than traditional courses, coursework, um, even traditional quote unquote online coursework. 
Uh, whereas in subscription-based and non-term programs, um, the, the actual percentage that an, uh, an institution is required to return is based both on the students, attend, uh, the students' completion of a period, but also on their progress uh, in that period, uh, and that there was a, a sense that there was a, a, a level of unfairness treating those programs in the same way and requiring institutions to use their attendance records. So we did not include those uh, because in the department's view, um, although those are somewhat different in the term in how they are treated for RTP4 purposes, uh, the fundamental logic that, uh, that we're using here about why we're requiring this still applies to them. Uh, those course, those, those kinds of programs often do, and, and in fact, in some cases, collect more data on students' academic engagement uh, and they're already subject to the RTP4 requirements and, for example, need to use in the student's official withdrawal date as the date of their withdrawal. Um, and this requirement would, in our view, simply make the calculations more accurate by having this institution rely on its attendance records. Uh, so for all those reasons, we did not uh, add the additional exemptions that were requested by negotiators. So I will pause there uh, and open it up for, for other comments from the committee. Thank you, David. Julian? Dave, so glad to hear from me on this. Um, so a couple of things. One, thank you for fixing the STEM issue and um, making it clear about how the department intends for um, this provision to work with respect to institution versus course. And to your sort of easy question at the jump, I, I do think it makes sense if the department's moving ahead with the definition of a distance education course, that that language be reflected in this proposal. So instead of talking about um, of course, offered entirely through distance education is fine. It feels like that's a place where you could just sort of sub in distance education course. That would be my suggestion. Um, you made all of the compelling arguments on my behalf for why direct assessment should be excluded. And I know we've talked about this twice already. So I'll just one more time say, since we met in February, the department released a really helpful Dear Colleague letter, Dear Colleague letter on Valentine's Day that talked about direct assessment. So I will read a portion of that, which gets exactly to why I believe that direct assessment programs should be excluded from this requirement. Um, part of that DCL says, direct assessment programs are a type of CBE program that do not use credit or clock hours. Progress in a direct assessment program is measured solely by assessing whether students can demonstrate what they have a command of um, demonstrate that they have a command of a specific subject, content area, or skill, or can demonstrate a specific quality associated with the subject matter of the program. Therefore, unlike a CBE program measured in credit hours, a direct assessment program does not specify the level of educational activity a student is expected to engage in to complete the program. So that feels really at odds with the rationale that, that the department that you just gave on behalf of the department for why these programs are not excluded from this requirement. Um, I think the proposal I sent in, I'll, I, I won't read through it because I'm sure everybody read it with interest, um, but there were two other uh, examples that I provided in that proposal as well, where the department has clearly indicated that these programs operate in a different way where some much of the work can happen outside of the traditional course room setting. Um, and that sort of coupled with the really rigorous uh, um, application process that institutions go through with the department to launch these programs anyway, um, I think make a really compelling case for why these should be excluded. Thanks, Jillian. Um, just a quick response to part of what uh, what you were um, arguing uh, and, and on those points. So one of the things that we, we thought a lot about uh, when we looked at your proposal um, was the extent to which attendance, as we, as we use the word colloquially, might be confused somewhat with the concept of academic engagement, which is the actual criterion that the department uses for establishing a last date of attendance, either for attendance taking schools or for in a, in a non attendance taking setting, the school is allowed to use the concept of academic engagement to establish uh, a last date of attendance. Uh, and your comments seem to suggest that schools would create artificial interactions um, or artificial check-in points or other kinds of, um, of requirements that would be intended to meet these, these uh, conditions for attendance taking. Uh, and I just want to be clear that the definition of academic engagement is pretty broad and gives institutions a lot of discretion uh, as to what they consider to be academic engagement and therefore qualifying for attendance. 
uh, and that uh, we were obviously if if this were to enter go into regulation, the department could respond to questions that schools have about what could and couldn't constitute that. Um, but in our view, the kinds of things that that go back and forth between institutions and their students in all of the kinds of programs that we just talked about um, are, are certainly things the school could use for its attendance taking uh, requirements to, to fulfill that requirement to keep up with uh, what students are doing and and when they're doing it. Uh, and it's our feeling that if a school is keeping up with their students and ensuring that they're making progress, they also know that the student is, for example, completing assignments, participating in group uh, discussions about particular topics, um, completing uh, in direct assessment uh, in the direct assessment world, uh, completing assessments, either pre assessments or post assessments. Um, a variety of different things could be used in order to fill that requirement. Uh, so in our view, um, this is still uh, actually making the making the RGT4 calculation more accurate um, and as opposed to simply allowing schools to use a midpoint um, to demonstrate how far a student has gotten in a particular period. Um, it's actually it, it, the the data last date of attendance does matter for the RGT4 calculation for these programs. Uh, so that's that's part of why we decided not to incorporate those other exceptions. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just respond to that. My example of institutions then sort of creating whatever to be able to comply with this. I, I think it speaks to how this is not necessarily in the best interest of students, because I think in these types of programs where um, students are enrolling in them in part in large part because of the flexibility, I think students are going to be surprised that there is a punitive expectation that on a particular cadence they're in the course room doing something that maybe doesn't have much or anything to do with the assessment that they might be working on. And then that student will end up getting withdrawn and having aid returned through I mean, I'll just say it, like through no fault of their own because we've had to sort of comprise this this system to keep up with these regulations that just don't make sense for direct assessment programs. So I think I think it's not a student friendly approach and I, I you know I would love to continue to have conversation if we have time for it uh, but I, I think it certainly is at odds with that guidance the department timely put out right after our last 30 session. seconds. Yep I'm done thanks. Cindy, you're on you. Joellen Price. Thank you. Um, so I was discussing this proposal with some other colleagues and the question came up, what happens to students at a school that does not take attendance and is not required to take attendance if they're in a combination of in-person and um, distance education classes and then they withdraw, officially withdraw. So if they officially withdraw at some date in October, uh, and part of the courses are in person and part of the courses are distance education. How are the school going to be, treat that student for R2T4 purposes in terms of last day of attendance? That's a great question. Um, we talked a little bit about this in one of, I think it was our first session, but I want to make sure that this is well understood because it's an important part of how this process would work. Uh, if a student is taking um, a combination of courses that are where they're required to take attendance and courses where they are not required to take attendance. This, this, the department views that student as being enrolled in a program where the school is not required to take attendance. So if you're taking four distance education courses and one on campus course, the student would be you would not be required to take attendance for that student for that particular period, which means that you could use their student's official withdrawal date or any other method that you were using to determine a withdrawal date that's allowed under the non attendance taking provisions. It's only when the student is enrolled completely in distance education courses uh, that this requirement applies. Excellent, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Any other questions, discussion? David, I'm not seeing any. Okay. Is it, you um, desire to move? Well, so I want to now open it up um, to the committee. Is there anything else about um, the RTP4 issue paper that you guys would like to discuss? Not seeing any hands, Dave. Okay. Um, well, seeing no hands, uh, I think I will turn it over then to uh, to Greg, um, and I think we could move forward with a consensus check um, on this topic. 
Thanks, Dave. I just, I just want to make certain that uh, 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 that there are no uh, other comments or anything else anybody wants to say on this topic before we um, uh, have the facilitator move to a consensus vote. And just to reiterate that if we take when we take this uh, vote, this is this will be on consensus, not a temperature check. Um, Erica. I just wish to clarify, I've had questions from members of the constituency of other nonprofit private schools and just um, asking a clarification that some of this is not a simplification, which is what um, I think Ed originally purported they were trying to do for RT24. Um, are, it, will the department issue some additional clarifying documents for that attendance taking issue? Yes, I can I can commit to that already. Um, we know that there will be questions that come up on that topic uh, and we know that the community will need um, additional information about how um, to to comply with it if the department moves ahead and, and um, does publish it as regulations. So we will be publishing guidance about how to uh, how to implement that uh, that requirement. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah, so I mean, same a little bit general comment. I think the funny part of this is I think a few of us were in conversations with some of our constituent groups last week where the recommendation was made that the department add actually add in the um, uh, academic engagement definition to this section because we, the way I read it, and I think what folks thought this was suggesting was that attendance sort of equaled academic engagement. So I'm, after working in this industry for 25 years, I'm like absolutely blown away, Dave, by what you just said, because it feels like what you're saying is those two things are not the same necessarily. Um, so just would echo, I don't know if there's a way to make that clear in this language. I know I know we don't have time um, or how the department intends to sort of um, communicate that broadly to the field, especially as institutions and will be in a position of having to, you know, sort of defend approach to program reviewers and other external auditors. It feels overwhelmingly messy. So that's a good question. I mean, we we absolutely are willing to provide guidance on that part of the work. Um, I guess what I would say is that the academic engagement concept was developed um, as part of the last uh, rulemaking that we did on this topic, um, and it was part of the consensus with the committee um, that was intended to show that the school is, is the one, uh, along with its accrediting agency uh, to some degree, um, to establish what is meant by academic engagement. Uh, and for the depart from the department's perspective, academic engagement um, doesn't have to constitute only one thing, and we recognize that it includes a variety of different activities um, that are essentially the school, the student working with the school um, on a particular um, academic issue that's related to the subject matter under discussion. So we, we decided to define it because we wanted to ensure that there were things that should not be included, and there are things in that definition that we clearly have outside the scope of that. But aside from those things, uh, and in the, in the context that I just described, the school has the discretion to decide what constitutes academic engagement. And as part of that same rulemaking, we took that concept and we connected it directly with R2T4 to ensure that when we're talking about how you determine a student's last day of attendance, if you're going to rely on your attendance records, you're relying on your records of whether the student was academically engaged uh, with the institution. Uh, so we have certainly, like I said, have no problem making that clear uh, in guidance to the, to the community that that is the, um, the, con the basic concept that, this, that the school should be aware of. Uh, and that's how they can design their programs around uh, that that notion of academic engagement. Uh, and it sounds like it, you know, it, there may be a need for us to to provide uh, answers to questions to colleges about um, different kinds of academic engagement, which we certainly could do as well. Um, if this if colleges decide that this rises to the level of a need for additional information. OK, thank you, Scott Dolan. And I, I guess as a follow up, would that guidance be specific to the types of programs that were uh, excluded from this particular provision, including uh, subscription based non term and, and direct assessment programs where we know, as you've even said here at the table, that those are a bit unique in terms of their, del their delivery uh, and. You know, they're not necessarily pervasive, so there's going to be really uh, 
a great need to be specific uh, to anybody who will be doing a program review about what this means and, and, and the stipulations that are outlined uh, here. So I think not only you know broad guidance around academic engagement and attendance, but how that might apply across different different modalities. That's something that we're uh, that we're agreeing to here. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, Scott. I guess I would I would say absolutely yes. First of all, we will respond to um, re the the request from the community about what uh, what needs to be clarified. I, I want to be a little careful uh, because the department um, doesn't want to come out and provide um, a, a definition, a, more guidance on academic engagement that actually constrains schools in ways that we don't intend. Uh, so we wouldn't probably wouldn't provide sort of broad guidance on that topic, but I do think we owe it to the community to provide answers to their questions about um, specific kinds of things that the school is doing with uh, with students or, or is designing as part of their programs. Um, it was not intended to be a gotcha exercise. The department wants to ensure that schools know exactly what they're subject to. Um, so we, we certainly can commit to, put, to putting out guidance about those kinds of things as we implement this rule. And I, and I appreciate the intent and I understand uh, coming from your perspective. However, sometimes what is intent and what is practiced are at odds with one another, uh, especially when uh, in practice and, and operationalization, which I think you know is a comment that can be made across a number of issues as we move move forward here, right? Uh, sometimes a stroke of a pen can lead to a whole number of unintended consequences here. So I think a commitment around that guidance is going to be really, really uh, important. Uh, as we move forward, especially if we're looking for consensus here. Okay, thank you. Um, David Cohen has come to the table um, in place of Julian Klein. David? Yeah, uh, just Dave, I, I'm just looking for some clarification. Are, are you suggesting that a school doesn't, an attendance taking school, in order for that to qualify, it doesn't have to be a set meeting time or place that merely submitting something could qualify for attendance, like they don't have to come to the Monday morning session at nine o'clock for the lecture and be recorded in, in there. Just merely submitting something is attendance according to the department now. To the extent that it is an engagement between the student and the, the instructor uh, about the course material, um, and that could be a variety of different things. It could be submission of an assignment. Um, it could be um, asking and getting a response to a question even, as long as it's about the course material that the student is taking during that period. Um, it, it, we gave some examples. I would I would point you guys to the, the, the 2020 regulations where we did, I think, talk through a number of different examples of how what, what it, uh, academic engagement means in this context. Obviously, the simplest and most straightforward way is to, yeah, to have a student be, actually be at a session and, and have attendance taken uh, that way. But it is definitely not the only way that a school can take attendance. Uh, and that was never the department's intent with uh, with these requirements. Great. Thank you. Hey, David, uh, David Cohen, um, you had a question in the chat about has the department considered how imposing an attendance requirement might impact active duty military studying from a distance? Right, so my concern was if they have to be at a place or time, you know, a set place or time in order to qualify for the attendance, how that could affect active military personnel. But if what David is saying, it merely requires the submission of something and a recording by the institution of that event, perhaps that resolves that. But I'm concerned that you know active military people who can't be at a place and time that's set up by a school in advance, um, you know that they would then you know be subject to you know problems. No, I think I th and I think that's the department def definitely did have that in mind, um, and and that that group of students, along with a lot of other kinds of students who there are really enrolled in distance education programs because of the flexibility that they offer. Um, we we know that many of these programs uh, and direct assessment programs is a good example. They don't involve sessions necessarily where a student is sitting with all of all of the other students in the class and like in a Zoom uh, call that like we're experiencing right now. They're they're submitting assignments. They're interacting with their instructor, um, and there's generally scheduled periods when they have to do that. Um, but those are not the only kinds of activities that can be uh, defined as attendance. Um, so we think that 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 plus the ability in certain programs for schools to put students on leaves of absence if there is an extended period of time where they're not going to be able to engage uh, and then come back. 
uh, provides provide ways for student schools to accommodate their students and their unique circumstances uh, and, and avoid withdrawing them unless, unless it really is clear that they have to withdraw um, for some reason. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple other questions, Dave, that were in the chat. Erica Linden, you ask a question. Um, who is now back at the table, by the way, as primary. Um, are there ever excusable absences that will allow for a student to miss 14 days or longer without automatically withdrawn? And I think I heard Dave, you just say that there would be if. Well, um, there's there's a difference. <laughs> OK, um, we're with this. I know RG4 is a very complicated topic, so uh, I don't mean to laugh. So there, a leave of absence is a specific and unique kind of status uh, that a student can enter. Um, and there's, there's a number of requirements around it in the Article 24 regulations. Um, and generally speaking, it has to be a stat that what, what's required for a leave of absence is established in your regulations. Um, student has to come back. If they come back in a term-based program other than a subscription-based program, they have to come back and at exactly the same point that they left in the coursework. I think the question about the 14 days was about absent a leave of absence. Um, is, are there exceptions to the 14 day uh, requirement? Um, and I think the answer to that um, is yes, on a very limited basis of where, and this has been the department's guidance for a long time. I don't think we intended to change it. Um, if, for example, uh, there was a school closure and the school had no means of, um, of actually att of, of getting attendance, taking attendance, the students had no way, no way of being, a, being in attendance, that kind of thing is an extremely limited uh, exception to the 14-day requirement. I would say that by and large, however, there, there are very, very few exceptions to that requirement. Uh, it would only be in cases where uh, essentially, the school um, had no way of keeping track of the attendance due to some kind of an un unanticipated closure or a loss of, for example, their distance education capabilities for a limited period of time. Okay, thank you. All right, Greg, I'm coming back to you um, as yeah. I don't see any additional hands. Yeah, the department would like to request a 10 minute internal caucus, please. Okay. Brady, um, can you make sure the department is all um, assigned to the large room? Yep, you all should and be there. So the department will caucus it is 11 o'clock till um, 1110, and then we'll get back together. Greg, let me know if you end up needing more time. Thank you, we appreciate it. Okay, thank you. We can go ahead and pause the live stream.
Okay, we are back on live session. Um, the caucus has ended. Let me turn it back over to Greg to see if there's any additional um, comments him or Dave want to make and uh, when they're ready to move to consensus. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Um, uh, David has a couple of clarifications he wants to make with respect to academic engagement and a uh, and a, uh, a, a minor red line edit. So I'll turn it over to Dave for that discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks. Um, so yeah, we it, it, there is certainly understandable confusion about what is um, a very complicated topic. I'll say that every time I talk about Archer T4. Um, so we did some very quick uh, diving into the regulatory language around academic engagement. Uh, and we wanted to sort of show you guys the regulatory chain of reasoning uh, that helps get us to the place that I've been describing uh, this morning. Um, so first, let's talk about the provisions in the Return of Title IV regulations um, where we talk about what constitutes academic attendance and attendance at an academically related activity. So you see on the screen here, 668.22L7 uh, Roman L1. Um, this is referring to uh, what we consider to be academic attendance and attendance at an academically related activity for the purposes of serving as the foundation for a withdrawal date in the return of Title IV calculation. And as you can see, it says must include academic engagement. So I can see where there might be some confusion that there was some requirement in addition to academic engagement that the department intended with, with the word attendance, but ultimately, what we mean here is that academic engagement constitutes uh, academic attendance as long as there's documentation of it. So if you have documented that engagement, you have met the requirement to use that engagement as a as academic attendance for Archer T4 purposes. So with that, let me go down to the 600.2 definition of academic engagement that we created in the, uh, the, the most recent uh, regulatory process on this topic. Uh, so number one, it's defined by an institution uh, in accordance with any applicable requirements of its state or accrediting agency. And then down to two, uh, we have a bunch of things that it includes, um, which are uh, synchronous classes, academic assignments, submissions, assessments or exams, tutorials, webinars, study groups, group projects, online discussions, interacting with an instructor about academic matters, et cetera. And then we have some exclusions um, where we, that we things that we've specifically identified uh, that are not academic uh, engagement or and therefore not attendance for RT4 purposes, living in institutional housing, and, and participating in a meal plan, logging into an online class or tutorial, but not doing anything else. Um, and that's where the crucial concept of engaging with respect to the subject matter comes into play. Just logging in is not enough. You have to actually engage in, in a particular um, academic activity in order for this to count. Uh, and then finally, participating in academic counseling or advisement. Um, so we hope that that makes this a little clearer. Uh, and I would also go say, say as well, this was the department's general approach for, for many years. This has not changed uh, actually probably for more than a decade. Although schools um, indicated that that it was not in incredibly clear and so we put it into regulation uh, and now that it's in regulation, we think that there is a pretty clear chain that uh, allows schools to use that concept of academic engagement to determine uh, whether whether attendance uh, can be used in the RTG4 process. I want to pause there and open it up if others have questions, comments, etc. OK, thanks, Dave. Any questions or comments or clarifications needed on what Dave just uh, explained? Doesn't look like it, Dave. So hearing none, um, we recall that in the earlier part of this conversation, uh, we Jillian suggested that we make a change, a wording change to the um, the language regarding distance education courses, since there is going to be uh, again if we uh, make the change in the distance education rules. Oh, go ahead, Vanessa, you can bring that up. Um, so we wanted to make the change here. Uh, we, we, we treat this as a relatively minor change. Uh, we think it's uh, appropriate to, to make it here uh, in, in an effort to reach consensus. Um, and so uh, this is uh, 
this each distance education course uh, as defined in 34 CFR 600.2, except for dissertation research courses. Uh, this is what uh, what we had in mind in our earlier discussion, uh, but let me pause uh, and see what folks think about this change uh, before, uh, before we finalize. Is this what everyone, what you had in mind, Julian, and is this, uh, does this make sense to the rest of the committee? I see yep. Julian is shaking her head and I don't see any other hands, Dave. Okay. Um, if there's no other comments on this, uh, I will um, turn it back over to Greg um, and I think we can move forward with a consensus check. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, uh, Cindy, at this point, I think we can move forward with the consensus check. Okay, sounds good. Um, for the purposes of consensus, we will utilize a roll call consensus. Um, so um, we'll go according to my screen and um, I will call out your name and um, where the position of your thumb is. Remember a thumbs up is your 100% in support. A sideways thumb means you can live with it and a downward thumb is indicating dissent and dissent um, you will be asked um, to clarify what your dissent is and offer any uh, potential remedy that might um, transpire. Um, dissent should be used if you have a serious concern over what's being proposed. Greg? Oh, I just want to clarify one more time to everybody. I think we've done that, but just want to be very clear. This is the consensus check and not a temperature check. So that's all I wanted yeah. to say. And the consensus is on the entire document. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Jillian. Uh, no, down. What am I? What do you need me to say? <laughs> um, we'll come back to you. Um, Robin. Thumbs up. Okay. Carmack. Thumbs up. Jesse Morales. Thumbs up. Joe Wigslar. Thumbs up. Joe Allen Price. Thumbs up. Or uh, Rice of King. Sideways thumb. Thanks, Laura. Joe Blondin. Sideways. Uh, Jason Lorgan. Sideways. John Ware. Thumbs up. Erica Linden. Sideways, Diana Hooley. Thumbs up. Jamie Studley. Sideways, DC. Thumbs up. Carolyn Fast. Thumbs up. Did I get all the non federal negotiators? Okay. Greg Martin. Thumbs up. So we'll circle back to Jillian and Jillian, please uh, indicate um, what your serious concerns are with the document and um, what would get you to at least a sideways thumb. Yeah, I don't have anything to add besides what I've already said, which is the direct assessment language that we've provided twice to the department. Okay. So uh, R2 T4 um, did not reach consensus. And we will uh, move on. So uh, Greg and Dave, um, next on the agenda um, for this afternoon was distance ed. We have about 40 minutes. Do you want to start into that? Uh, yes, I think we can start with distance education if, as long as Dave is ready. If it's a, uh, uh, Dave, do you need any time before starting that? No, no, I think we can move into it. Okay, then we'll move into the discussion of distance education. Okay, great. Dave? All right, thanks everyone. So let's turn now to the distance education issue paper. Uh, so uh, I won't talk through everything uh, that's currently in the paper, but as last time, I wanna talk through um, all of the areas where the department made changes. Recording in progress. 
uh, all the we want to talk through all of the areas where the department made changes uh, and areas where we received um, uh, proposals uh, and and potentially and in some cases did not make changes. Recording stopped. Um, so if we could scroll down just a moment. All right. Uh, so the first item uh, we we also we actually already alluded to in the prior um, discussion. Uh, we are proposing to add uh, a new, a fully uh, new definition of a distance education course um, that uh, would uh, track with the IPEDS definition of a distance education course. Uh, and this was a, originally a, a negotiator proposal, uh, which we think makes sense um, to ensure that schools have a clear understanding of uh, what constitutes a distance education course uh, and what does not. Uh, and we've defined it as a course in which instruction takes place exclusively as, des as described in the definition of distance education, which as you, as you guys all recall, uh, is the sort of fundamental definition of distance education involving regular and substantive interaction, et cetera. Uh, in this section, uh, notwithstanding in-person non-instructional requirements, including orientation, testing, academic support services, or residency experiences. So I'm gonna pause there and open it up um, for comment from the committee. Hey, thanks, Dave. Jolene? Um, thanks. So appreciate the department being open to the suggestion that I made on the comments about, um, or the language about the residency experience. I guess my one comment is because that residency experience falls after, I think it's not instructional. I'm not, I'm not sure that's accurate. And I guess I hesitated asking this question because I wasn't sure um, what to suggest in terms of a solution. I don't know if you can just sort of swap the construction of the sentence, um, but I don't think residency experiences really are not instructional. So curious, I don't know, maybe the department can provide some thoughts on that and then happy to sort of work to finesse the language if that would be helpful. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a good point. Um, the, we use the concept um, in, in part because it was uh, derived from the iPads uh, uh, guidance on this definition. Um, and, you know, I think we're open to swapping it around uh, if you wanted to say excluding residency um, requirements and then saying uh, or other um, uh, in, in non-instructional in-person uh, requirements. That was um, going to be my suggestion, so yes, I agree. <laughs> okay, um, well, I, I want to look to my, my department colleagues, including Denise, uh, and see if they have any concerns with that, but I think um, I think if 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 they don't, I think we could go in and uh, and and make that change. I don't think there is. Okay, uh, so Vanessa, um, I don't know if you have this uh, this one up and available to uh, to do uh, uh, live redlining here, um, but if you do, there we go. Um, I think uh, so, Jillian. I think what you had in mind is. Um, it would say a course in which instruction takes place exclusively as described in the definition of distance education um, in this section, uh, notwithstanding residency experiences, comma, actually no comma, residency experiences, and in-person non-instructional requirements, including orientation, testing, academic support, or, or academic support services. Yep, I agree. Thanks. Oh, wait, no, no, just, just, you can just, uh, yeah, there you go. And then an or before academic support services. Okay. Uh, other comments on uh, this definition then? I'm okay. seeing any. Uh, DC. Yeah, just just for the the layman people out here who, um, you know, enjoy the conversations on semantics and sentence structures. What 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 does this change do, or is this just to make it clear for people to understand it? Because what I don't what I what I also, what I notice in one example, I want to make sure I understand if we're going to constantly keep repeating it, is this the, the constant structural changes in of, of sentences and, and wording that might be getting too pedantic in how we're negotiating what we're trying to achieve. And so help me understand Jillian or the Department of Education. Why why was it moved from the end to the middle? And is this going to be a constant um, 
kind of requirement for us to move consensus forward as we think about other language um, as we get through the rest of the, the, the week. So two part question. The first one is why, you know, why that simple change? <laughs> um, and then is this going to be a constant throughout the week that's going to preclude us from getting to other consensus on other issues? Well, it's OK. It's OK. Let me answer the second one first and then I'll, I'll ask, ask Jillian to uh, to explain. Her. Sure. Um, so I think this is this rewording is a very typical part of negotiated rulemaking, especially in this final week. Um, we have recognized that wording does matter, and in some cases it can have a substantive effect on the regulations or, and in this case, I think, and that Julian can correct me, a, a substantive effect on, on the uh, school's understanding of the requirements that they have to follow. Uh, and we want to be sure that that the wording is clear for that reason and that we don't uh, have unintended consequences again either substantively where something is enforced that we didn't intend or cases where a schools schools really don't know what we meant uh, so the department is generally willing uh, to make these on the fly changes um, and of course negotiators have to kind of think about these changes as well we typically won't make major major changes in this way dc um, we typically will, will as, as we talked about earlier, um, come back in a later session after negotiators have had a chance to view bigger changes um, to ensure that you've had time to think through them. But for these more Thanks. minor changes, uh, we find it to be more efficient to just make the change on the fly and, uh, and, and finalize the language so that we can move on. Yeah, thanks. And I'm happy to I agree with everything they've said. I'm happy to speak to your first question, DC, which um, so many programs, I think typically programs that lead to like licensure outcomes um, have a requirement that there is an in person like a weekend component sometimes where students who maybe are otherwise are in an online program are required to come together and get sort of didactic training in person. And they're typically it, it doesn't run the length of the term, right? So a lot of times it's a weekend or it's like three or four days. Um, couched within an otherwise 100% online course. Um, and so my argument is that those actually are instructional. In institutions have designed them to be instructional. Um, accreditors require them to be instructional. And so I just didn't want that um, modifier to be attached to residency experiences because I didn't think it was accurate. I think for an institution that's required to offer these for a program, there could be confusion about, well, but what if my residency experience is instructional? Would it still be considered a distance education program or distance education course should I be reporting it or not etc so there would be like downstream impacts from sort of the um the structure in which that proposal was created Does that makes sense yes it makes complete sense I just I, I what I start to notice is that the 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 the, the if we're going to be constantly having to change that in that way we might be spending more time in things that I think the intent was still there, whether you put it at the beginning or the end. And I think it, I just want to make sure that as long as if that is the, the purpose of us voting, that the intent is still there regardless of it. Then it makes it, it didn't require us to do that, right? And so I'm just trying to understand if that's going to be a constant thing that we're going to be doing, then that's a different interpretation of what I thought we were going to be doing today. But it makes sense um, what you're what you're trying to achieve is just whether or not it could have been achieved in the same way. Okay, thank you. Any other questions um, surrounding the change that was made in that particular section? Dave, I don't see any more. Do you want to move on? I think so. Paper? Uh, so, Vanessa, if you want to pull that back up again. Okay. Um, so now we're moving to the second change that the department made um, per negotiator requests. Um, we had we had talked uh, in previous um, sessions about how to incorporate a requirement um, that would be in addition to the requirement for institutions to establish what we call what we are calling provisionally uh, virtual locations um, where they would report their students who are in fully online programs. Um, but negotiators also requested that we collect um, data at a student level uh, about each student's uh, distance education enrollment. 
Uh, and so uh, the department uh, has agreed here to do that. And we thought that the best place to put this, Vanessa, could you scroll up just a little bit? Um, to put this was actually the um, disclosure section, um, the student rights no, uh, which will, because in part, um, this, this section uh, of disclosure and reporting requirements uh, deals with other similar reporting requirements, and because we expect that this information will be provided um, to students and, and their families as consumer information, if not through the department's website, then potentially also by institutions themselves. Uh, and we have added at the end of that section, now let's scroll back down, Vanessa, um, a new paragraph H um, indicating for each recipient of Title IV HDA assistance at the institution, the institution must submit to the secretary in accordance with the procedures established by the secretary, a report regarding the, the recipient's enrollment in distance education or correspondence courses. Um, we didn't want to get much more specific than that. Um, we do agree by and large with the overall concept that we've discussed previously of obtaining information about a student being not enrolled in distance education, partially enrolled in distance education, or fully enrolled in distance education. Um, but there's a lot of things that the, that the department and specifically the Office of Federal Student Aid is going to have to work out about um, this new requirement. Uh, and I would also mention that uh, at least as of right now, um, we do not believe we could implement this um, in, uh, in July of 2025. This would be something that we would have to delay somewhat. Um, but of course, we'll, we'll continue to evaluate that uh, and make decisions on that uh, before the publication of the final rule. So with that, uh, I want to stop and then turn it over to the committee for discussion on uh, this new provision. OK, thank you. Uh, I want to note that Scott Dolan is coming to the table in place of Erica Linden. Julian. Sorry, um, just one comment. I'm not even sure I have a language suggestion, but I, I think um, the language that many of us sort of co-signed on, I think the idea was around um, and not trying to solutionize for the department, right? But like attaching this to sort of NSLDS or COD records as the institution is sending across that information already just in the interest of um, efficiency and that because that happens really at a like term enrollment level not an individual course level i just would want to make sure and i understand what you're saying about the department needs to figure out how to do this and i'm sympathetic to that but i i, I don't think any of us were suggesting making a more arduous process um, if there is a way to attach for example term enrollment information to files that are already being sent by the department which so that would sort of track back to what the suggestion was around fully in person, partially in person, fully um, on ground, or that's not the language, but you know what I mean, as opposed to this, which sort of suggests it would happen at a course level. And I don't, I, I'm not, my operational people will kill me if they think I suggested that to you. Um, so I just provide that feedback. I, I'm comfortable, I think, if this is how you think you need to sort of paper it, but just a strong suggestion to leverage the, the reporting functionality that already exists. Thank you, Julian, and that is exactly what we have in mind. Um, if I, I, I'm sure I didn't uh, say it with, the, with exactly the specificity that I needed to, but the idea here would be that we'd use the existing process for reporting enrollment and essentially add this as a requirement as another layer of reporting um, when a school reports on their student. So, for example, most schools do, do this reporting um, once per payment period for their students. They indicate whether they're enrolled full time, less than less, uh, three quarters time, half time, less than half time. Uh, and as part of that, they would also indicate for the student for that period, not for each course, but for the full period, are they enrolled in some distance education courses? And that's we're going to we would we would use the concept of distance education course as the basis for this concept. Uh, are they enrolled in none? Are they enrolled in some? Are they enrolled in all? Um, that's the, that's the general way that uh, that we anticipate that we would do this. Of course, like I said, um, this this does still require some evaluation on our part as to how we would exactly what the mechanism would be, how frequently, um, etc. Um, but right now, yeah, we we anticipate adding it to existing enrollment reporting. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Scott Dolan. Yeah, at the risk of breaking protocol here, I just I, and I understand what you're saying, Dave, but but it's really hard to understand how we might want to vote on this without kind of having some more specificity around cadence, frequency, and 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 the like. Um, so, 
and I, I guess I'm, I'm understanding you want some latitude, latitude there from a department perspective, but from an institutional perspective, it seems like some clarity around what it is, what direction we're moving might mm. might be beneficial. I, and I maybe not as much of an issue for my institution, uh, but certainly for uh, the other you know, with the thousand or so private nonprofits um, who are going to be wrangling with some of these new definitions uh, as we as we move forward. So, um, and, and I'm guessing I'm hearing, you know, trying to make this both efficient for for institutions and uh, and uh, enable the department to get the information uh, that that you need, which I which I understand completely, and actually would be beneficial to all of us, right, to have a better understanding of students and and where they're enrolled, and so we can start to. Look at outcomes in a more reasonable way, but um, but I guess I, it's more of a comment than it is a question. I, I get a little bit concerned without some of the specificity being in here about what what it is exactly what we're doing and where we're going with it. Thanks, Thank Scott. you, uh, Robin Schmidt. One suggestion I have is maybe rewording it to say the institution must report to the secretary in, in accordance with the procedures established by the secretary, the recipient's enrollment in distance education or correspondence courses. Just to be clear, that's all the department's asking for here instead of, I, I don't know what exactly what institutions are concerned about, but that would be sort of a little clearer that that's all the department's asking for. I think we'd be open to that. Um, and in fact, Vanessa, do you want to pull up the language here? I mean, it sounds like from, from what I'm hearing, there are not objections to the approach. There are not objections to um, what we're proposing here, but there are some need. There's a need for greater clarity, um, and I think we're open to that. Um, so, uh, could you say that again, um, uh, as to as to Robin, what uh, what you had in mind um, for, for the board here? The institution, the institution must report to the secretary in accordance with the procedures established by the secretary the recipient's enrollment in distance education or correspondence courses. So Vanessa, after the, uh, so the word, you see the second instance of the word secretary, after the word secretary, um, uh, after the comma, add, um, go ahead, Robin. Sorry, and then take out a report regarding So, and I think you said you would start the sentence with uh, the institution must report to, uh, to the secretary. Uh, I didn't. Uh, that was all I was talking about. Oh, okay. So, so this was, these were the changes that you recommended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, other comments? Does this help? Um, and do we need some? It sounds like. Um, from from Jillian's uh, uh, comment in the chat that this helps. Um, does this help on for others as well? OK, hearing no other comments. Um, uh, so I think the department is um, is willing to make these changes and, and use this as our final red line. Um, I think we can move on from there. Okay. I should also mention because we do go ahead and you can pull it up, Vanessa, but we'll also include a discussion about this in the preamble um, to ensure that what 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 our intent is and how we propose to collect this is part it would would be part of the existing enrollment reporting process, um, just to make it clear for the community. Go ahead, Vanessa. What do you want me to share? I'll go back to you. You just go back to the uh, the red line text. Okay. Uh, so I think is this at the end of it? Um, yeah. So if you scroll back up, um, we did not make any further changes um, to the concept of asynchronous coursework, and, and then you can keep going, Vanessa. Um, we did uh, receive a proposal um, from negotiators um, in an effort, I think, to achieve consensus that would have limited um, the use of asynchronous clock hours to 
no more than 50% of a Title IV eligible program. Um, in the department's view, um, that uh, although it would uh, stem potentially uh, some of abuses at, at programs that, that have almost fully distance education, uh, or fully um, asynchronous programs uh, that are operating clock hours, um, our concern is actually um, primarily about uh, the partial portions of programs uh, that are offered using asynchronous coursework, uh, which we believe is the most typical uh, way that this is offered uh, in, in clock hour programs. Uh, so sim simply limiting it to 50% of a program um, doesn't uh, alleviate the department's concerns about, about both abuse uh, and um, the, uh, the potential expansion of, uh, of how, this, how the department is paying for instruction in clock hour programs. I want to pause here because I do want to mention we received um, some, some requests for data on this topic. Uh, and on, unfortunately, the department does not have data on the distance education status of clock hour programs. However, we were able to confirm that there are approximately uh, 8,000 uh, programs that are offered using clock hours. Um, these programs are primarily um, non-degree, leading to uh, credentials below the associate's degree level. Um, it would, if the department uh, in the future um, would like to collect additional information on clock hour status, uh, the distance education status of clock hour programs, but that data does not currently exist. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't provide more on that topic. We also were asked um, for information and guidance um, um, the department has given on this topic, uh, and we did provide that um, between sessions um, to, uh, to negotiators. Um, and we did, we also wanted to talk through some specific information about the non-compliance that we've identified uh, and the kinds of questions that were being asked by institutions about this uh, topic. Um, but before I get there, I will uh, I will turn. I see that there's a couple of hands, uh, so let me um, open it up for just a moment uh, to uh, our our non-federal negotiators. Okay, Scott Dolan. Yeah, can you just clarify? I'm, I'm going back to January, right? Uh, where um, the rationale for this change was provided for the department, right? There's a reason why we think we need to remove asynchronous altogether for clock hour programs. The reason given was that institutions lack the technical expertise to really monitor clock hours in the way that was required by the department um, with a hint towards some of the abuses. There's been no evidence marshaled by the department regarding the abuse uh, that you've seen uh, and at what scale uh, you've seen it. We, we've heard anecdotally uh, uh, from a few of you that that, that there, we should be assured that this has existed. However, when you talk to our creditors in this space, they're, they're, they find it hard to find uh, instances uh, that you're talking about. When you talk to the legal counsel that represent a lot of institutions in this space, you, you find very little evidence of the abuse that you're referring uh, to. Um, so I just want to hear more clearly what the rationale is for the change. Is it really about abuse? Is it about that these institutions aren't meeting their outcomes, which, you know, given the uh, proposal that was submitted by a number of us, um, it was pretty clear um, that a lot of these programs are lead to licensure. Uh, so there's clear measures that already exist around outcomes that our creditors and the department uh, should be monitoring as part of this work. Um, or is it about the technical expertise component of this? Though I will say if it's that, even the department has highlighted very specific examples of, of programs that are doing this appropriately and well in accordance with the guidelines that have been provided to institutions. Uh, just one quick thing to, to remind the department here too is that the guidance was given to institutions, but has not yet been given to um, uh, folks who are doing program reviews and audits. Uh, and so have, you know, it's not even been monitored by the department as part of those program reviews just, just yet, uh, because that guidance hasn't been provided as was uh, mentioned in, in February. So bottom line question just to, for this first part would be, what is the concern? What's the problem that we're trying uh, to solve here, and can we be clear on what that is? Is it abuse? Is it that these institutions aren't meeting outcomes, or is it they let they lack the technical expertise to really carry out this uh, monitoring? A couple of things, and I want to turn it over to Denise. 
Uh, the first is that um, it's not accurate to say that our program reviewers uh, don't have procedures on this. Program reviewers do have procedures about how to evaluate asynchronous clock hours. Uh, and in fact, that is the way that we would identify problems in this space um, ahead of all others. Um, Non-federal auditors uh, do not have uh, specific procedures on this. Um, and uh, to be frank, Non-federal auditors um, are rarely able to dig in to requirements around such things as asynchronous clock hours uh, to the degree that would be needed in order to identify uh, real non-compliance. Uh, although the department will still consider uh, asking auditors to do more in this space uh, over time if we ultimately decided not to change this regulation, um, but we don't think that they are the ones that would be able to find this. Um, program reviewers do understand uh, these changes. Uh, however, um, during the pandemic, the department was unable to, per to perform as many program reviews as we had in the past uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, uh, one of the things that, um, that comes up a lot when we talk about this is that we don't have many, um, uh, you know, a whole host of data on this. Uh, and that's part, partly because uh, it, it's our belief that this is not a widespread activity yet. I think what's partially driving um, our concern, uh, and I'm going back to our, our original reasoning for this, is the abuse that we've identified in the cases that we've identified, it, uh, which in some cases have been extreme, as well as the kinds of questions that we're getting from the community about the requirement, um, which by the way, is a the Department of Education specific requirement. This is not a requirement that accreditors are required to monitor, so most accrediting agencies would not even be aware that schools have to, uh, to comply with this particular requirement of the department. The accrediting agency knows how the program is being offered and it has its own requirements, but it's not going to be thinking about how to measure a clock hour for purposes of the Title IV programs, and nor would we expect them to. Um, so let me turn it over to Denise now to talk through uh, some of the specific cases that we've that we've encountered about this that sort of raise these concerns. Can I just I, so yeah. so this is not part of a verification of compliance procedure that would be uh, a component of a, an accreditor's responsibility uh, upon review. No. So, is it, this is okay. this is not something an accreditor looks at. The accreditor looks at are they offering distance in accordance with the accreditor's uh, requirements for distance education, uh, which which do sometimes include things like verifying identity. That is an important piece of this that might relate to this. Um, but in terms of measuring a clock hour and ensuring that a student attended 50 out of 60 minutes in a clock hour, no, uh, accrediting agencies are not uh, required to uh, to perform that activity. So, you know, I'm, I'm certain it's this something uh, Scott, from a credit analyst. Yeah, 30 seconds. Uh, great, thank you. Um, it's certainly something we report on uh, from a credit analyst perspective to our institutional accreditor as a component of a review, right? In addition to reviewing our standards, uh, creditors are being asked to take a look at as a gatekeeper to the work that the department is doing, uh, compliance with Title IV regulations. So uh, I might be wrong on this relative to clock hour programs. I would think there would be some parallel uh, expectations and I'll hop back in as necessary. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. And then I'll leave, um, I guess, Jamie to come in on accreditation, but I haven't seen this issue raised in, in any kind of accreditation reports that I have seen. I'm not saying it hasn't. One thing, a couple of things to first point out is we don't have a lot of data in terms of specific. We can't give you examples, but this is going to be found primarily in program reviews, which is the area that I do a lot. I work with the teams on on the program reviews and what they find there and taking actions against the school. So one of the things that we've noticed, I'll give you some examples. I, we've already talked about it, and I also did want to point out that the department did talk about the uh, mechanism for uh, monitoring this, but a big part of it, and we did lay that out in the first session, was the abuses that we've seen. Um, I brought some examples out before. We've seen situations that are, that are as bad as, you know, having somebody curl their hair, send a video in, watch a YouTube video, and then they get hours for it. Assigning what they think, um, how long it should take somebody to do something, like a, a project or whatever, and assigning clock hours. And when you get back to the definition of a clock hour, it says instruction. We're talking about instruction, and it becomes even par more paramount and hands-on training programs, which are most of the ones we're seeing these issues. Um, 
We have other cases where we've gone in and we were able to get from the platform to go in behind and actually check. And where they were getting, student was getting 300 hours, we were able to find out they were actually really only online in these programs, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and be given 300 hours for it. So we are seeing a, a lot of abuses and these are, some of these other typicals go out and read a topic and then write something up on it or answer some questions. These are typical things that you would have seen prior to the explosion of distance education as homework items in a clock hour, traditional clock hour hands on program. And now they're being turned into clock hours of instruction and they don't really meet that definition. And one of the other things when you're saying there might be a, a small amount of abuse, and I think I said this before, sometimes the department's obligation to the integrity of the programs to help the students to make sure they're getting the training, because in these cases that I'm bringing up, the students were also harmed. In them. It wasn't just simply a, a taxpayer issue or a, something against the program. The students were not getting the training they needed and they couldn't go out and get jobs in the field. Um, so we want to make sure that we're protecting everybody, but there's sometimes we do have to regulate to the bad actors. And this is one of those situations. We've also seen because maybe because of, of the pandemic and seeing how much, you know, how easy it is to just say we're going to be distance ed, um, an explosion. So even if we might not have a bulk of institutions right now where we've seen the problem, we're seeing an increase. Um, and I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm seeing a big increase in the amount of situations we're seeing where schools are claiming clock hours asynchronously and the students aren't getting the training. And when you were talking about outcomes, one of my more recent cases, it was very bad in this situation. We did check the licensure passage rates in, in this case and they were abysmal. They like five, 10 students out of classes of 100, 200 students that actually passed the licensure exam. And I don't know what the states ultimately do and when they might cut it off, but from our perspective, that's not okay. And so in order to stem this abuse, that we think this is the best way to do it and putting like just a 50% cap isn't really going to get us where we need to go. So this that's the department's reasoning and we do have a large example of abuses that may not be as widespread, but we see an increase in it growing. Thanks Denise. Job London, you're next. Yes, uh, I do want to clarify something that Scott brought up. Um, yes, uh, I can speak for the Higher Learning Commission and we do have a federal compliance component to all peer review. So um, there's that. The other um, question that I had is rather than impacting 8,000 institutions and, um, you know, is there a way to put any kind of guardrails? I know that Denise just spoke to that a little bit, but I think that that this is going to impact programs with unintended consequences, nursing programs, uh, particularly practical nursing programs, state tested nursing assistant programs that are doing this right. So I also wonder too, if there are ways that uh, we could think about some type of, of guardrails or, or even um, a re another reporting mechanism, because I think that taking out a asynchronous totally is, um, is going to have uh, major impacts on students uh, that we don't even realize in fields that are much needed uh, to close skills gaps. Thank you. Um, real quick before Jamie goes, I, I just want to make one clarification, uh, which is that uh, what the number that we gave was 8,000 clock hour programs, not 8,000 institutions that are offering um, clock hour programs. Right, and right, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. It's that, that, that there are many institutions that offer a number of different programs um, and, uh, and then it's the number of programs, not institutions. Go ahead, Jamie. Still a lot of programs. OK, um, My can you, Jamie, can you hang on one second? Um, we have two hands up, Jamie and David Cohen. We have um, approximately four minutes before lunch, so we'll take those two and then we're going to break for lunch. OK, so Jamie. Or breakfast, as the case may be. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's OK. Um, my point is uh, uh, similar uh, to Joe's and um, what Scott was saying. Um, listening to the public comment over the last few weeks, um, I realize is another set of anecdotes, but there were students who were describing uh, the value to them of asynchronous learning. 
um, in ways that um, I did here as providing examples of access for people who could um, pursue post-secondary education with these kinds of options um, and might not be able to otherwise or might not be able to move forward. Um, Denise really put her finger on it. Um, this is a case of regulating to the bad actors and sometimes we need to do that, but maybe there's a, a more subtle way to allow the, um, the opportunity for it and to regulate or to um, uh, tighten uh, something else. She's right that there are outcomes that we can that can be used to determine whether a program is achieving what it's meant to achieve. David um, may be up to make the point he made in um, the chat about military people whose schedules require it. Just hate to see us in a, in a moment of uh, flux for technology and offerings to close something that can be positive completely rather than trying to find a way to um, manage it when it could have real value for um, a, the exactly um, a set of students that we'd like to have opportunities for. I do not have the perfect solution, but I don't think we're there yet. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. David Cohen? Just briefly, because I don't want to kind of repeat what people have said, but I was going to say to Denise, you know, has the department considered those quality assurance issues to define what good quality online asynchronous clock hour learning would be rather than imposing a ban? And then the only other point that I will add is that I was approached at a conference in Washington by an active military person who indicated that this type of ban would force them to give up the programs of study that they were in. And I was wondering whether the department has considered the ban and the effect it would have on active duty military who are serving our nation. Who cannot then participate in, in clock hour education asynchronously. OK, thanks, David. Um, there are a couple comments in the chat. Uh, Joe Blondin added when students need maximum flexibility and technology provide solutions, why disallow the entire practice? So these are things that um, you can ponder over your lunch. I do want to remind the public to utilize the correct link for this afternoon's session as it is a different link than what uh, you were able to access this morning's session with. So make sure you make that adjustment. With that, I think that we can uh, go ahead and um, pause our live stream. And we will take our lunch break and reconvene shortly before one o'clock. So we're ready to start at one. <laughs>